got a, a panel now um, with Mark Ray, who will be chairing. I'm going to ask Mark to do, uh, ask the panel to introduce themselves. Um, but I'm going to introduce Mark. So where is Mark? I can't... It's, oh, there you are. Yes. It's because of the lights. I'm really sorry. Um, so Mark is Connected Places Catapult's Ecosystem Director for Maritime and Ports. Really super experienced and innovation has been absolutely at the heart of his work. So um, let's uh, welcome Mark Ray. Thank you. Turn David's uh, glasses to him. So uh, first, is mainly because I don't knock them off and then break them. So, uh, so yeah. Good morning, all. So, so as Joe said, I'm Mark Ray, ecosystem director for Maritime and Ports at the Connected Place Catapult, and we are uh, one of a series of catapults um, across the country. Uh, we specifically are the urban accelerator and the uh, placemaking um, catapult. So we focus on basically anything that physically exists in some form of urban uh, urban environment. So, so that's a, a little bit about us. Of course, in the maritime sector specifically, we're concerned with, with three main focus areas. One, of course, is what we're here today to talk about decarbonisation. We're also interested, of course, in the deployment of digital technologies to drive efficiency of operations. And then, of course, looking at uh, autonomy and robotics and the, uh, again, operational improvements and safety, uh, sa addressing safety concerns. Today is all, of course all about decarbonisation. Uh, we've had some great presentations already this morning, so I can skip vast sections of my uh, introduction piece because uh, we've already covered a lot, of course, around the, the basis of why decarbonisation is such an important factor for the maritime sector. And this isn't something which is just going to slowly bubble away and just be a slow progression, as Jo said with her quote earlier. This is very much about revolution within the maritime sector, and it's happening at increasing pace as we look at both the operations of our ports and, uh, and infrastructure and, of course, in relation to the vessels and shipping uh, that, uh, that are out there. And with these assets, these significant assets, these ports, these vessels having such a long asset life, being in excess of 30 years, you've seen the targets uh, and the legislative targets which are requiring us to be at net zero by 2050. This, of course, therefore means that the assets we've got and are putting in the water and are putting on the ground now are still going to be here in 2050 and are therefore going to need some form of retrofitting. So we need to start thinking about how we're going to transition those assets towards, uh, towards net zero. So targeting net zero, the opportunities and challenges that presents, that's the subject matter for today's panel. And I'd like to therefore call forward our, uh, our panellists who will introduce themselves. Uh, so in alphabetical order and uh, no order of particular preference, uh, I have uh, Andrew, Ian, Joseph and Tristan. So if Andrew wants to come up first, because he's in here somewhere. Yeah. You really can't see anything up here. Hello, Andrew. Andrew, do you want to take the, the first hot seat then and introduce yourself? Or afternoon now. I'm Andy Ewer. I'm a senior consultant at Ricardo. Um, we're a, a global strategic engineering and environmental consultancy uh, firm. And the work that we tend to do is to work with various uh, governments, uh, organizations, policymakers to advise them on um, the best policies and strategies um, to achieve their goals towards achieving net zero. Thank you, Andrew. So next up then, alphabetically, then is Ian from Fraser Nash. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Tarpley from Fraser Nash. I manage the business environment, sustainability and climate advisory practice. Um, we're a systems engineering organisation um, heavily involved in the transition to net zero. Um, what we've recognised is that the, the organisational and systems engineering challenges to deliver net zero are massive and we help our clients to do that. Thank you very much, Ian. Next up, then, I uh, have uh, Joseph from one of our sister catapults, so the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. So, Joseph, welcome. Uh, nearly afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I'm Joseph. I'm a clean maritime project engineer for uh, Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and uh, my focus is on how and what infrastructure will need for alternate fuels. And uh, yeah. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. And then finally, uh, we have Tristan from Serco. Welcome, Tristan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Tristan Drapis. I'm the head of maritime future capability for Serco Defence. So we manage uh, around 98 uh, auxiliary small craft platforms for the Royal Navy in the uh, dockyard ports around the UK. Fantastic. Thank you, Tristan. So. I get to uh, exercise chairs bold here and uh, get to ask a series of questions to uh, to, to begin with uh, from our uh, from our panelists. But then afterwards, we will certainly have we'll cast the uh, microphones open again, so we'll welcome questions. So do start thinking about any questions you wish to ask any of our panelists. You've heard what organisations they represent and where their interest areas are. And of course, anybody online, again, if you want to type up the uh, the, the questions, I assume that's what goes onto that board there, is it, or is it Ian that runs the food? Ah, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Ian. So, yeah, if you do have any questions online, again, please do feed those through, and uh, Ian will be f um, filtering those and bringing them um, to our attention to hopefully present to the panellists as well. So, without further ado then, Tristan, first of all, um, we've already heard um, from our speakers this morning um, about some of the fuels and some of the energy sources uh, that, are, that are out there, and David, of course, has given us a, a, a quite a comprehensive presentation there on what Maersk are doing, of course, with their larger container ships. So with your broader context uh, of the range of vessels that you're working on, what is that, uh, is there that, that, that wonder fuel out there? What are the options and merits of the various types of fuels for these different types of, uh, of working boats and, uh, and vessels out there? Thanks, so yeah, unfortunately, definitely there is no wonder fuel. Um, and we've seen the presentations earlier, the, the challenges, you could, you could literally go through each one and uh, look at the current challenges, uh, which we've certainly done in, in some of our work, trying to support the Navy in its sustainability aspirations. Um, so the battery and electric is, is one we've really looked at, and the port infrastructure is a real challenge. Um, Chris, you sort of talked about electric charging earlier and smoothed over it. Well, it is definitely a serious issue for us in, uh, from a berth point of view, getting national grid to the berths. Um, Portsmouth National Port have got a great project going at the moment to, to electrify two of their berths. Um, it's, it's very expensive and it's very complex and in the Navy dockyards equally complex uh, with different contract programmes, landowners and, and so, so that, that infrastructure is, is the key challenge with a battery. Um, and similarly with the small vessels you've got storage on board and, and variable uh, demand profiles for the energy. So. Battery is definitely something we're, we're exploring, but it's, it's challenging. Hydrogen's another one we're looking at, and Devonport Dockyard's doing some great work with hydrogen storage. Um, again, there's issues with fuel density, safety case, uh, bunkering. Ammonia is another one for safety case, really good for low emissions. Um, yeah, methanol looks really promising. Um, Ask done some fantastic work uh, with methanol, um, but scalability will also have to be something that we look at. Um, and, and some safety case and some emissions controls in that. So it's difficult. So when you look at what you need the fuel to do from a capability point of view, and you think about the um, quality, the reliability, the availability, uh, from a defence point of view, survivability in operations, uh, it's very difficult to see past marine diesel, which is fantastic, all those, all those things, um, and to, to work on an alternative. Um, but so the will is there and, and there's some really good work going on and it's really just uh, baby steps collaboration to try and um, prove small cases or mask some large cases and start building that uh, evidence case to uh, start moving concepts into high TRL capability. And of course diesel is quite a ubiquitous fuel and it's quite a, a resilient fuel in terms of, uh, as you say, in terms of in different conditions. Are you starting to see though uh, You've said, you mentioned earlier about Devonport, about doing some small trials. Are you starting to see that in, in, in possibly in even in other countries as well? Are you starting to see them doing trials in, in different conditions? And how are some of these fuels performing in these, uh, in these different locations? Have you got a view on, on that? Yeah, and, and the fuel performance is generally not the issue. It's just the, um, it's the replicability and the confidence you've got if you've got a global operating profile that you can go from one port in one country across the world to another port and have the same the right support network, have assurance in the quality and safety and specification of the fuel. Uh, it's, it's those sort of elements. So if you were, if you were localised to one port, 
the, the quality and the um, performance isn't so much the issue. It's, it's that scalability is the challenge. Yeah. And it, and it took us, I understand, it took us 70 years to get there in diesel to get to a point where we had the standards in place and, and we all know we were. 2050 doesn't allow us 70 years of, of development <coughs> time so there. So, so are you seeing, and are you involved much, and this could be open to anybody in the panel, uh, are we seeing much in the way of, of, of that sort of fuel development standardisation ongoing at the moment and who's leading on those, those aspects? So from a regulatory point of view, I don't think there is um, that targeted a drive, and I think it's just because there's so many possibilities still out there and so many work streams with the different fuel types. I think it's hard to be that, that direct and laser focus from a regulatory point of view. But I think it's up for industry to just keep uh, building the, the test cases, building the demonstrators, getting the data. So we're talking data later in the week, but it's really important to get actionable management information and, and real world operating data to, to start to really test some of, the, some of these new fuels and uh, what the capability limitations are. Andrew, possibly an unfair question because I'm not sure whether you're involved in that, but Ricardo, we're involved in a, a bit of the hydrogen standards uh, development. Are you aware of where that's got to specifically then around maritime fuels, or is that um, a different part of the... I appreciate Ricardo is a big organisation. That's that. not something I've been involved not, in. Not something you're involved in, OK. Of, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. OK, we'll, we'll move on then from, from there. J Joseph, then, to, to, to talk now about the electricity generation, clearly... Offshore wind is a significant source, not just now, but certainly growing substantially as we go forward. So electricity availability in at source, out in the water, what's the sort of developments in there and how's that energy being transferred to, to, to land side and made available? So there's, um, to the best of my knowledge, there's a bunch of technologies that are already exist, but they're coming together and, like you said, about the demonstration scales and whatnot. Um, shore power is obviously mentioned previously and electricity onshore, but how do, you, how do you actually get it to there? You can use offshore wind um, energy produced from the wind farms directly just simply transferring it to shore power and use electrification there. Or offshore you can use what I'd just call a buoy or a substation out there and you can plug and play with small vet smaller vessels nearer the wind farms. Um, other options, you could utilise hydrogen for fueling as well. So you lose uh, technologies using seawater and desalinate it. Then you've got H2O, use the H2O, the, ele the electricity from the wind turbine, and therefore produce hydrogen, which you then can later use for actual fuel. Yeah. So they're just a few options. And the facility you've got just up the road here, um, sorry, my geography is not too great. It is definitely north of here, isn't it, in Blythe? Um, so not too far up the road. What sort of facilities are you developing there and, and, and how, how far along are some of these sort of technologies uh, then to, um, I mean, are we already at deployment in terms of trials or is that, are they, where are we? So a lot of the ones I've just mentioned are mainly on a, a demonstration sort of scale. So I, I believe that pre someone previously mentioned the maritime demonstration competitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been involved with some projects that as part of that and funding f from that. Um, Blythe, to the best of my knowledge, is not where I'm based, but it's they use uh, facilities there for testing wind turbines and blading and whatnot. Um, down in Grimsby, where I am based, we plan on utilising and setting up at what we're going to call the National Food and Maritime Hub. And we'll be, hopefully, that'll be used as a s sort of a centre where we can use and show and showcase infrastructure such as hydrogen bunkering, methanol, um, or even just electrification. Yeah. Fantastic. And I in terms of the, uh, and I appreciate your obviously concerned more with the offshore um, water, certainly when it came to the deployment of, of onshore um, e electrification in road transport, one of the big inhibiting factors, of course, was that availability of electricity, that availability of the, the charging infrastructure. Uh, you said about the Clean Maritime Hub being developed down in Grimsby. So how how much of that sort of technology and those solutions, how much are they sort of standardised? How readily or how easy is that to deploy and scale? Obviously, there's a business model behind that in terms of, of off-takers, but how easy is that to, to develop and, and install? 
um, it'd be quite easy to develop and install them on a piece by piece or say a port authority or a particular company that's interested in developing it and using them for themselves so this like most for example um, but having it as a standardized one where you could have it around the UK it'd be a lot harder and you'd need regulatory backing for that okay uh, and a positive question for perhaps for both you and, and, and Trist, Tristan before I move on then in terms of those those um, solutions do you see them evolving that they would be and this may be something that David may want to comment on as well. Will they be dedicated solutions for individual off-takers, or do you see them emerging as a, a, a shared resource, a shared access point that we're all using the same, same facilities? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can take a siloed approach to it. I think um, th there's going to have to be significant sharing and collaboration, and even within different fuel-type solutions, we're already seeing um, propulsion that's combined... Uh, electric and hydrogen, for example, um, and so I think it's going to be a really, really collaborative effort because that's going to benefit um, the individual ports and the operators. Yeah. Anything else, uh, Joseph? Or the, the no. Yep. Great. <laughs> okay. So, so Andrew, just move on to you now. So, so this is obviously quite complex um, engineering and, and re-engineering needed, particularly if we're starting to now look at, uh, at the, the retrofit uh, sector, if the assets are already in existence, we want to transition either partially to, uh, towards net zero or, or going the, f the full distance. Clearly not a, a weekend project, uh, particularly for some of the larger vessels. So, so what, sort of, what sort of approaches are you, are you sort of seeing emerging? What sort of things are, 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 you know, approaches are, are people taking? You know, where do people find that sort of <coughs> guidance and support and examples of, of those that have gone before? I mean, I, I think for me, the, the thing that's lacking at the moment is kind of guidance from the top down, and it's been a bit of a recurring theme this morning in that we really need, in, in the UK's case, the government to take a position and, and lead on this and put sort of clear, well-defined targets in place and elaborate on the timeline that they want those targets to be uh, achieved over. Obviously, internationally, we have the IMO with the uh, greenhouse gas saving plan that they've uh, re-released this year that you know, puts down the market to have a 40% reduction in carbon intensity by uh, 2030, I think it is, but at the moment there's still no clear way of, of how we'll get there. I think we've spoken a lot this morning about green fuels, but we need to kind of stop and think what do we actually mean by uh, a green fuel. So I think in, in David's presentation now, you, you presented, you know, two standards of just one of a low green... Uh, a high greenhouse gas haven and a very high greenhouse <coughs> gas haven where we have you know, 70 to 80% greenhouse gas reductions and 80 to 100% greenhouse gas reductions. I think that's something that's still lacking from a, a policy direction and that has really imp important implications in terms of the, the cost that would be associated with uh, transitioning to these kind of alternative technologies. And I think it really needs the government to sort of put down a marker of what they want in terms of know reductions in carbon intensities I think the IMO is a good start but how do they want that to um, evolve uh, over time and I think the refresh of the clean maritime plan that's expected I think uh, later this year although we're running out of time potentially early next year um, is a really good opportunity for them to lay down a marker in that respect and, and set an ambitious uh, target and trajectory towards that, um, that target and like I say, the, the nature of the targets are important. It's important that it's clear and we really define what we mean um, by a green fuel. Um, and again, that's something, another topic that's came up again and again this morning is what is the fuel? Well, I don't think we're ever going to get a, a government or international organisation coming out and, and picking a winner. But by defining these criteria, what it does is it allows the industry to infer what the likely winners might be. So... For example, can we make methanol and ammonia, which seem to be the popular choices, uh, meet these greenhouse gas reduction standards? And the kind of follow on from that is produce them sustainably so that they're not having other negative impacts on, on the environment. Um, so I think that's the kind of minimum that's needed from, from my perspective. Actually, my background is in the aviation sector and you know we're maybe a little bit further down the line, but not too much further down with in terms of um, developing or transitioning to lower carbon fuels. And I think what we're seeing there is in that, in, in that case, these kind of incentives from government to reduce carbon intensity 
and also pricing schemes like uh, the greenhouse gas pricing scheme proposed by the IMO actually in itself isn't enough to de-risk these investments. I think still because of the significant cost differential between uh, traditional fuels and um, low carbon fuels. Um, so in that case, what they're looking at in, in the aviation sector, for example, is mechanisms that can uh, increase revenue certainly for fuel, fuel producers and al allow them to provide the, the fuels to the market. And I think the reason that I've came back to fuels and that I think they're so important is because they're sort of the nexus for risk for all of the stakeholders that are involved in decarbonizing the sector. There's a risk for the producer in terms of they don't know if somebody's gonna want to buy the fuel that they produce. There's a risk uh, for the vessel owners and operators because it impacts the, the fleet that they kind of uh, develop now and, and going forward. And there's a, a risk for the ports because it's the infrastructure that they have to develop uh, over the next years. They need to know what, what that's going to be. Um, so for me, that's the reason I think that that's important. And um, I think obviously more generally, just to finish on this, um, the government has a role to play in, in funding activities around this area, which, which they have done and have a good track record of doing in the maritime sector. I think for me, uh, it would be beneficial if there was a push away from more kind of uh, feasibility and demonstration type studies towards pre-commercial and commercial deployment of technologies to really, um, to really get the sector moving. Um, sorry, jump in there, please. Yeah, I think um, the challenge from the regulatory point of view is there's so much technological change and such fast change in digitalization, AI, autonomy in maritime that it's just hard for the regulator to keep up with, with the evolving trends and to, to get the regulation out there. So then when you put in the, um, the alternative fuels and the safety cases and, and the quality provisions, it's just, uh, yeah, it's going to be really difficult for them to get ahead of, ahead of the speed of the technology which obviously puts a bit of extra risk on, on suppliers and operators. Yeah, no, we certainly will all be looking towards the, certainly the, the refresh of the Clean Maritime Plan, and uh, I don't know whether anyone else has been involved in the, in the work on that, uh, but the, certainly the workshop I attended was very much, unfortunately, uh, those ones were all about retrospectively looking backwards to see, uh, using David's acronym, you know, where have we got to? But there wasn't, I wasn't privy to any discussions about where we want to go or how we want to get there, it was very much a, a review, and I don't know whether anyone else, uh, that may come up in the questions later, if anyone else has got any, uh, have been involved and got any other uh, insights. In uh, aviation, just switching back to that, uh, sorry, uh, again, uh, again and Andy, in terms of their infrastructure, because aviation, again, are sort of well-established physical assets uh, there with lots of complex infrastructure already in place, how are they, are they looking to reutilize those existing infrastructure assets and just switch out the, 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 the fuel types or are they looking at deploying new infrastructure systems within those, uh, within those environments? I, I think from the aviation sector, largely what they're looking to do is utilize the existing infrastructure. Um, and I think the argument that's made for that is that you know, they, they have a very specific set of properties that the fuels have to have to maintain operability, whether or not it's on the ground or in the air, you know, over a range of uh, physical conditions. So what, what's happened in that industry is the majority of the fuels that are currently approved for use are essentially clones of fossil jet fuel, mm -hmm. which means that they're what we call drop-in fuels and can be completely compatible with existing infrastructure. I think at the moment there are some limits on the quantities that you can blend with fossil fuel, just as kind of research and development goes on to make sure that they can be used safely, but that's very much the approach that's being used at the moment is to develop essentially clones of fossil jet fuel that can be used in uh, aircraft. So in the early stages then, just explore this a bit further, so in the early stages then, of course, the production of these cloned fuels surely is going to be significantly more than utilising the existing diesel. I appreciate from Chris's slide earlier that that's going to reach a, a parity point before too long, and certainly within the uh, within within the next possibly within the next ten years. But in the interim, how are they segregating? The, if you're dropping fuels in, how are they ensuring that you're being charged for the right type of fuel that's going going through? Uh, are they having dedicated infrastructure and breaking up the infrastructure? Or is it still utilising the existing? Model? How's that working out? So far as I know, that's something that's still kind of under consideration. I think, in terms of the production, you'd have the fuel certified as a sustainable fuel making sure that it meets the various criteria that have been 
put in place, so the one again would be the greenhouse gas savings that you get and various other sustainability criteria to make sure you're not doing things like encouraging deforestation or you know, causing other indirect um, effects. And that would be essentially a, a property that's assigned to a specific batch of, of fuel. Um, following that, you then blend them at some point with aviation fuel. And I think the idea is to put a system in place where you can track, um, this is at a, a European level, you know, track the, um, the, the various uh, quantities of different fuels that you're blending together to then measure the impact and keep track of the impact that you're having by using these types of fuels. Great, thank you. Uh, Ian, we talked to there a little bit, touched that side, talked to there on, on infrastructure, um, and obviously that uh, we're going to need uh, new forms of infrastructure introduced to existing working ports. There's obviously a fair degree of, of disruption associated with that. What's your what's your take on and your experience on on how to to minimise that disruption and make that a more palatable thing to to disrupt you know those day to day operations? Um, so. So from my experience, the sort of things that we, we come across there is actually <coughs> starting to look at models. So actually modelling operations for ports, actually modelling the way that those ports run to actually see where those changes to infrastructure can be beneficial to the way that they operate and the scale of the change that's needed. How can that actually be, be beneficial? I mean, something that sort of has struck me a lot about the conversation so far today and actually we often have with is the net zero transition is often seen as a, a sort of a challenge to be overcome or a problem or a, an issue or th that, that sort of general language comes out quite a lot but actually if you look at it as a benefit and start to think about it as what's the opportunity by making those infrastructure changes what's the opportunity we can actually achieve by doing that how can we reduce our logistic chains how can we improve our efficiency how can we change the way that we operate in a beneficial way is I think probably the, the best way to look at that. Um, in terms of the actual improving operations, what we would expect to see is, is some of those models and early stage modelling to try and almost game what some of the challenges could be when those infrastructure, infrastructure changes are made. Much of my earlier work was around was around uh, adaptation and, and resilience to climate change rather than the, the mitigation aspects of this. So how do you see those sort of things being introduced into the business getting and how would that shape possibly the, the, the infrastructure um, provision? So I think that that's a really important bit to consider when you're looking at some of the, the, the changes that need to happen to transform to achieve net zero is that we are going to be operating in a very different changed climate in the future. Um, sea levels will be higher, sea states will be more aggressive. You'll find that actually you have um, brand new disruptive technologies coming in. And so the way that you design your infrastructure might need to be different. You might need to think about infrastructure that's adaptive to those changes or infrastructure that's resilient to those changes in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you have to start looking at what those climate related risks might be to organizations. And I think something that really struck me earlier in, the, in one of the polls we put in was that I think the majority of people said their organizations are planning on a two, three to five year time horizon. But actually when you're looking at net zero transition and climate change, those plans need to be substantially longer than that three to five year time horizon. And if you're going to make infrastructure changes now, those infrastructure changes today will be in a very, very different climate in 20 or 30 years' time. Yeah. And they need to be future ready for that. So in terms of temperature rise and, yes. and flood resilience, and anything, any, what sort of factors should we be considering in those ad adaptations then? So, so, so there's, there's the sort of standard climate change factors, so temperature rise, sea level rise, things like that. But there's also transitional changes. So when you're looking at, at for instance, one, something else that struck me earlier is, is just the sheer scale of energy demand that's going to be needed. Mm -hmm. And actually, you have to start to build the infrastructure to support that energy demand in every single bit of infrastructure change that you make today. Mm -hmm. 
because that energy, I mean, ports are already putting significant pressure on local grids. And if you look at the energy demand for some of the fuels that you're looking at and things like that, the, the level of infrastructure you have to now integrate into some of those ports, either to take energy off from offshore, um, some ports might have to go down other routes like micronuclear plant and things like that to actually generate sufficient energy to, produ to produce their sustainable fuels. Yeah. There's two more aspects I wanted to explore with, with, with there, and, and one of them will be bringing in the, the question from, from, from Peter online, so thank you, Peter, for, for that question. But the, the, some of the earlier work I did in another sector was around, uh, was around particularly around driving autonomy to protect workers against some of the uh, climate change uh, matters that will come along, as well as, of course, the, the desire to decarbonise. But one of them was around solar radiation and the rises in solar radiation uh, levels. And I don't know whether you've done any uh, work around, uh, around there, around how do you protect workers uh, and people who are outside uh, from those, uh, those levels through technology. Um, so I personally haven't done very much work around that if through technology. Um, I, I will say that we have, we have done a fair bit of climate-related risk work for organisations who are starting to see significant operational challenges for out, outdoors workforces, in particular around temperature and solar radiation and, and reducing man hours out in the outside and reducing productivity. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at the projections or climate projections, that productivity for people who work outdoors will reduce yeah. as a result of climate change. And um, there will be increased amounts or increased periods of time where people just can't work outdoors. Um, not no, not so much in the UK, but certainly in some other some countries elsewhere around the world, they're they're already experiencing significant downtime. Yeah. So clearly, moving over to you know, electrified operations gives us that opportunity to bring in those autonomous systems, which then yeah brings those people out. Right. Uh, we're going to jump on to, to to Peter's question. So uh, Peter, Nishan, thank you very much for your uh, your question online. So Peter's uh, question. I'm not sure quite which one of you would like to answer whether this is a, a combination. But Peter's asking the question. Could we see uh, ULES style zones, so that's ultra low emission zones uh, for those who aren't familiar with the acronym, style zones introduced for the maritime industry being adopted here by the, by the UK government. So being having those zones applied, I'm assuming it means by you know, in port locations where you, of course you've got high levels of, of, uh, of urban build up around those ports because they're often in the centre of uh, towns and areas so you've got lots of domestic uh, domestic uh, properties around so uh, any thoughts on on the ap the, the application i guess uh, of those is that an applicable solution what sort of impact might that have what are the the, the practicalities anybody want to jump in there so i think at uh, sea we've already got marcos already got uh, secret zones and low sulfur emission zones i think so i think that that, that will only expand um and certainly within ports so if you look at Portsmouth City's green plan, it definitely in includes the port, the dockyard port and the international port. So I think it will all be part of the same same puzzle, absolutely, uh, going forward. Um, yes, I think that's just a, that's the trend that will continue. I, I personally think it would be a good thing to have something along those lines, in particular to deal with, I mean, from, from that increasing energy demand um, to drive some innovation around the technologies that produce that energy because it would be a bit counterproductive produce to produce your sort of low carbon fuels using diesel generators and, and, and other hydrocarbon based generators on ports, in ports and things like that. So, so I do think actually you need some form of, of mechanism to make sure that new developments or new energy developments within port facilities are low carbon or not low carbon, have low emissions. Um, in particular, also to support local air quality. Yeah. And Andy, uh, have you experienced any of this in terms of your carryover from the aviation industry as well? Are, are, they, are you aware of any sort of activity we could learn from them? Obviously, they're very great, at, you know, they've got very distributed emission zones uh, from them. Is there any activity that they're doing that we could potentially learn from? I, I think it's something that's definitely starting to pick up. I think the focus up to now has been very much on CO2 related emissions. Um, and that is moving away towards now the, the non-CO2 emissions, so kind of uh, soot and other uh, other emissions that are generated from from the aviation sector. 
so I think it is definitely it sort of seems to be a natural progression from you know once you get the the CO2 issue I wouldn't say under control that may be a bit too optimistic and then I think you can move on from there and start to think about um, about about how you might apply that more broadly. Okay, brilliant. I did have another question here, but I'm going to jump onto that one because that one uh, on the uh, the deck there looks uh, far more interesting. So we have one from uh, from Alex. So thank you, Alex, for your uh, for your question. Um, and you can take some turns if you like. And I don't know who wants to go first. So which is one of the worst innovation decarbonisation projects you've completed, and what lessons did you learn from it? So anyone want to? venture a, a response to that. <laughs> no, I'm going to be brave. <laughs> Can't Tristan, you've jumped in first each time. I think, um, <laughs> so I'll talk around it. And I think one of the challenges we've encountered and probably an approach we had that was wrong, um, not necessarily just in, in circuit, but in industry, is that it's quite easy to sell uh, electric vessel or, or like the really jazzy futuristic asset. And it's a much harder sell to say, actually, that the real cost is all the electric cables underground that you won't see and where you've got to plug the boat in. Yeah. And, and I think that's where we've gone wrong slightly in that we can, we can sell to government the new assets and they will put extra money in for new assets, but then what to do with them? And actually realising the infrastructure pretty much has got to come first. And I think that's something that was picked up with the Zevi funding, where they're actually, what's, what's your infrastructure plan for your new assets? And so I think if we had a time again, we'd probably have focused a lot more on the underpinning support needed for the, for the future assets yeah. rather than just what the end product will look like. Yeah, interesting. Anyone else? Yeah, Ian? So I, I haven't come across any bad innovation decarbonisation projects, so to speak. I have come across innovation projects that haven't considered decarbonisation mm -hmm. as part of that innovation project, and then that delivers counterintuitive results. Yeah. So I think that's probably, it's, it's a slight twist on the question but I have come across those sort of projects where decarbonisation or carbon reduction hasn't been a factor when the technical specifications have been set up for the project, yeah. when the outputs for the project have been considered, when the results for the project or the intended results for the project have been considered, and that's driven unintended effects. Yeah. Joseph, were you indicating that you had something to add in? Yeah, I would just to continue what Tristan was saying about the projects and challenges and whatnot. There's nothing, I wouldn't say there's been any, any bad projects, but rather there are still lessons learned. Um, and I said the main one is communication. So a lot of different parties don't necessarily know what and how and just generally how to go about de delivering projects and whatnot. So it's best to, it's quite easy to say. And, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say then. Um, it's quite easy to know it's quite hard to know what you don't know yeah. and it's quite a hard thing to actually communicate that in projects so i'd say that's quite a, an obvious challenge and a lesson learned yeah i mean lit lit carbon literacy is a big big challenge and i know and i don't want to steal your funder because i'm not sure whether you'll mention it later but yeah the, the port of time has done a, a, an extensive project on developing carbon literacy for those who aren't familiar so they can understand and start to get I guess a, a degree of empathy then with the with the, with, the, with the subject matter. That's, that's coming tomorrow. Is it so right? Yeah. Okay, I will I'm say just no conscious more. Conscious, we've got um, we're on our final. We're at our time. Are there any, are there any final questions very quickly from the audience in the room before we go for lunch? Okay, um, I was really absorbed in that. Thank you <laughs> so much, everybody. What a great conversation. Um, well done. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>